blessed love and peace. Um, we got a few things to share today. Uh, focusing on concentration. The first joint uh, has five parts. Five parts. Uh, and it is those five parts, single parts. Again, English, this is expensive. The requirement is land for mixed heritage. Kutuhaun, a melange Kutuhaun, and Aomi Kutuhaun, cultural village. Oh, the pretty is just unprecedented. Unprecedented pretty. Patented, copyrighted, and such. All right, um, five parts, single parts. This is English, y'all, it's expensive. Single parts. Those parts, four of them are, it's just topics basically that are related and we're sharing them in a sequential way. Um, it is native or indigenous, colonialism, colonist colonialism, imperialism and plantation those are the four then we get to the fifth one god willing unannounced unpronounced and all that all right so the first one indigeneity indigenous native everyone is native of something on this earth of inamaka so the solution is connecting with that nativity i just shared the joint a few hours ago about water the living water and how we feed the plants it's through the roots it's not through inundation over the head over the leaves over the tops it is investing humbly in the nature of water to the roots for the roots to absorb that hydration and circulate it for itself amidst the plants not inundating drowning the plants with the quote-unquote living waters that others Claim to have and share. Wada, serious. Is that blasphemy against Jesus? Do your, do your studies. How does Jesus share? Does he come inundating with floods? Or does he approach gently and humbly and simply share at the base, the foundation, the soil around the roots? Ha ha, indeed. Jesus is different than the apostles and the di disciples of today. I don't even know if this is sleep or whatever else. If it's like near the end of the day to be having sleep, but whatever. Here we go, continuation, and we're outdoors. We gotta be careful of the touchy-touchy outdoors because there's a lot of toxins and pollutions, particularly when we're sitting on the ground. <laughs> Facts. All right, so nativity, native. Everybody is native of some place specific of this earth. Many, some, for some people, many places. The solution is connecting with that nativity, what our natures are, knowing what our natures are and being at peace with what our natures are and continually nurturing what our natures are because that is what is our health and well-being. If we come from hot places, understand that, know that. If we come from cold places, understand that, know that. And, and, and when living in some place that's not cold or when living in some place that's not hot, don't try to make it hot. Don't try to make it cold. That's not the nature. All it is is frustration and pollution and dissonance, disease and whatnot. So you're fighting against yourself and the nature of creation. You're not going to conquer it. You're wrestling with yourself. So that's what that is. So nature. Now that being said, knowledgeable about it and, and being respectful for other people's natures if you don't want to if you don't want to be respectful if you don't want to deal with people with their other natures don't be in their other natures don't live there don't live near there don't utilize what comes from there plain and simple mathematics of life that's the solution because the pollution that's being caused today is by and large the derivative of competing in a, the endeavor of conquesting each other, um, which is a derivative of endeavoring to compete with and conquest our own kind, which is a derivative and endeavor of competing and conquesting our own individual selves. 
So anyway, that's a little bit too, it's a little bit abstract, a little bit esoteric, but that's that. Point is nativity, that's nature, that's solution. This is a different vibe observing this at the moment, so we're gonna work further on the concentration accordingly, because this, this, what I'm sharing is actually comparatively simple. Uh, and actually, do I say this here? Yeah, 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 let's do that. This is coming from a recent conversation that I have with Dear Kinfolk, um, talking about the experience of being native, and talking about the experience of colonialism. So even before I finish completing the definition of each of the terms of indigenous, colonial, imperial, and plantation, that's the conversation that we have. When these are the terms that we talk about specifically, each of these, we talk about in the, the, the whole of the conversation that we're talking about at that time. Um, and we, on our side, are utilizing certain terms, emphasizing imperialism, uh, and the kinfolk that we talk with uh, are talking about colonialism, and uh, particularly from the experience of being native, and then also uh, referencing the experience of plantation and talking about these different terms. Plantation is something that we utilize uh, historically for a number of years in describing people's domesticated mentalities. Um, and so we're just giving a definition of these terms and how we utilize them, how we understand them, uh, and the, and the diff difficult or the different nuances uh, within each of these terms and the, the chargedness, the political differentiation um, and affiliations to, between these terms, even though they may seem similar, and the people who communicate them might seem to have similar intentions, but in actuality, very different. And and it, it takes a certain like honesty and just clearness of of recognition of the differences, differentiation between terms to recognize what the intentionality is. Because some people utilize these terms and have very little intention of of like the what is hinted at solution. And in, in, in actuality, are actually very much entrenched and committed towards continuing the afflictions that those terms are supposed to be uh, uh, criticizing and otherwise. So uh, we'll get to that, God willing, in a minute. Um, so continuing with the definition of terms. Native is just where we come from. Uh, knowing our heritage, knowing our language, the customs, our relationship with nature, that is foundational for having basic respect for nature, water, clean air, all the things that people talk about. It's not an advanced scientific um, cognitive evolution. It's a matter of going back to our roots. That's where the solution is because science takes us away from all this. Science takes us away from that relationship and that respect and that health and well-being with nature. So it's, the, the solution is not coming from science and that's no, that's no shade and no hate on science. Um, to just understand that the scientific people, uh, doctors and engineers and everything, they're not, they don't have the solutions. They're not, they're, they haven't studied the solutions. They've studied the problems and, and, have, and have, have collectively committed the, the pollution. And additionally, we, and we're all responsible for that. But just to recognize the answer is not coming from that. The answer is coming from a healthy relationship with nature, water, minimizing the pollution that we're causing, uh, minimizing our utilization of technology, uh, and all the infrastructure uh, and indirect uh, causes of pollution for us to do the basic things that we do, where we get our clothing, food, shelter, uh, and basic supplies, all the pollution that's caused from those, um, those processes, uh, to minimize that. That's what the solution is. And that means getting closer to our relationship with nature, recognizing what our basic needs are, and being satisfied with just our basic needs, and then focusing on our culture, any luxuries, any extravagances, being attached to our rituals. The times of the year when we have a feast and investing our sense of uh, indulgence and otherwise along those lines. Because it's, even when we do that, we're doing it in harmony and relationship with our ancestors and with, with nature and the seasons and additionally. So it's a greater purpose than just us uh, um, uh, flexing or, 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 or um, uh, getting our rocks off or whatever else it's for a greater purpose and so there is there is it's not even allowance there is um, there is acceptance and there's even support and there's even commandments to feast on special occasions particularly for this reasons and so rather than just doing it when there's a windfall or whatever it's a matter of aligning it with greater purpose so uh, but and, and again with with uh, with our heritage with our native uh, experience and, and relationship and when we find ourselves in different lands than where our, our ancestors grow up and and additionally reconcile with that and and find out where our balance is and recognize if, if one is on a different land 
not to endeavor to be the number one on that land. That's counterintuitive. It's going to be a continual guest experience. And humble, get in your lane and humble yourself accordingly. And you can talk about being the first of the earth and, and everything else like that. And then in that scenario, you know, what happened? And, and, and answer that. Because whatever happened, you have yet to, to respond to that call into those conditions. So in the meanwhile, still humble yourself, get in where you fit in and find your lane and respect those who are here before you until you find that answer and share that answer. Native. We can go on and on further about the, the native experience. We can talk about people being shells, black, white, and otherwise, uh, people being slaves, people being pimp talked, pretend and believe that they're not slaves. And meanwhile, losing their sense of self, speaking imperialist languages like English and French and otherwise, um, even studying Latin and Greek, that's all imperialism. It's not even white, it's imperialism. It's not even Mediterranean, it's imperialism. People can talk all they want about China or whatever else. What's the difference between a white person speaking Chinese compared to speaking Greek? There is a difference, but how much of a difference? Anyways, that's a side note. Anyways, native. Colonialism. So just recognizing what a colonialism is, it's when, it's when a kingdom or an empire, I don't want to mix terms, so I'm not going to say empire, but it's when a, a society sets up a satellite office in a distant land and tries to control it from that satellite office. That's what a colony is. Um, that pertains to the Roman colonies, that pertains to space colonies or whatever else. It's, it's there being a headquarters and then, and then opening up shop like a franchise in another location and, and trying to like control that block. That's what a colony is. Um, so it tends to be that the, colon, the, the, the kingdom, we'll just say kingdom in this respect, the kingdom, the initial kingdom, learns like it has been fighting in its neighborhood for a long time and has learned how to like kill people very well has got weapons and and learn how to uh, build armies and march and, and and take over resources and everything with with the tremendous skill but it needs to sustain itself so it needs further lands it needs further food and additionally so it goes out and it meets people who have not learned those things yet and so they can it's easier to conquer those other people for a short period of time because it's extremely difficult and it's extremely expensive to maintain a colony because at some point as we find with the united states eventually the colony gets a mind of its own it's like why do we need headquarters we can set up our own shop uh and not only that yeah we can go back there and, and take over a headquarters what you talking about so that's that's the, that's the the slippery slope and the uh the dubious prospects of imperialism and 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 well yeah there's imperialism but i'm, I'm skipping ahead in, in the categories of topics but anyway that's what a colony is it's basically setting up a franchise and and uh conquering another place or trying to conquer another place and um taking over the, the indigenous people the indigenous ways of that other place um whether it's through religiosity whether it's through politics whether it's through military or whatever else That's a colony. Now we talk about imperialism, the third term. Imperialism, as we are sharing it here, as we are defining it here, is a primordial phenomenon. The imperialism is the systemic manifestation of selfishness, of greed, hatred, and delusion. It is beyond any particular region of the earth. It is beyond any particular language or ethnicity or religiosity it is a phenomenon like gravity plain and simple that's what imperialism is imperialism is like a bug like a disease that infects people and guides people into being further manipulative violent um, enslaving oppressive predatory and otherwise and it's extremely intelligent, it's genius, uh, and it's extremely effective and additionally. It's, it's extremely um, influential and convincing and otherwise. So, uh, and it works, it's, it's not a color. It's, it's, it's not limited to white people, it's not limited to black people. It manifests itself 
in the most opportune occasions of, of civilization. So it manifests itself in China, it manifests itself in India, it manifests itself in the Mediterranean, it manifests itself in America, or excuse me, it manifests itself in Akabalan, Africa, it manifests itself in Europe, it manifests itself in the Western Hemisphere, in Native community. Even before the arrival of Columbus, ain't nothing new imperialism. What's new is the, the technology um, that's introduced through world imperialism when it comes to the Western Hemisphere. So that's, that's the distinction, but imperialism exists uh, before before the arrival of of, of um, the settlers and uh, 1492 if you like or uh, 1100 what if you like with with uh, the the Scandinavia imperialism exists on this on this hemisphere before that because it's the primary look at the Inca look at the Aztec look even within the Mayan even within other tribal uh, nations uh, north of the of the uh, equator and north of the, the middle path of the earth um, so imperialism is distinct from colonialism because colonialism is a specific methodology of extending uh, kingdom and, and conquest. Imperialism is the primordial phenomena that precipitates those, those uh, as ambitions and otherwise. So um, understanding the distinction between imperialism and colonialism and understanding why is, is very beneficial, it's very prudent to emphasize and concentrate on the phenomena of imperialism rather than colonialism because and this is not this is not some kind of like a um, like uh, trying to like distract people away from like the the atrocities of settlers of Europeans or Mediterraneans or whoever else on this continent or in Africa or otherwise it's not it's not distracting it's not it's not like double talking that's not what this is it's a matter of understanding the root causes and colonialism is simply an extension of imperialism so when kinfolk talk about colonialism and that's it kinfolk are continuing simply to manifest imperialism because people are not talking about the imperialism and when people talk about imperialism in kind of quasi terms uh even within rastafari down with with oppressor and down with uh, white imperialism but then referring to his majesty as his imperial majesty what the fuck? Literally. That's like, wait, down with this type of imperialism and oppression, down oppression. But then we, we're going to worship, and we're not saying us, but we're saying when they're Rastafari, worship the, the black imperialist. No. And with all due respect and love and peace to our brethren in Rastafari, just recognizing how the, 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 the confusion and the cloudiness about the terms we're utilizing distracts us from the solution and we know within Rastafari what solution is I tau it's living in nature in the garden away from Babylon but how are you gonna say down with white Babylon and 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 then bow to a, a black Babylon because that's what it that's literally Babylon is imperialism and so when any in, in imperialistic phenomena is 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 uh, down pressure so anyways that's it that's the difference between colonialism and it's not we can we can talk about it further uh, concisely or otherwise specific but recognizing that colonialism is a mechanism it's a tool um, and that imperialism is a root cause a primordial like there's no conquering imperialism just like there's no conquering devil there's no conquering there's no outliving devil the way we conquer devil is by being humble and distancing ourselves from the corruption that's the way it's done there's no, there's no killing the devil. There's no over outliving. There's no, uh, I should say, there is conquering. Excuse me. There is conquering the devil. There is no uh, outsmarting the devil. That's the thing. There's no outsmarting the devil, and there's no outpowering the devil. There's none of that. Um, there is conquering the devil, but the conquering of the devil is actually conquering our own ambitions, uh, and conquering our own greed, hatred, and delusion, and distancing ourselves from the trappings and the temptations of the devil. Um, that's what conquering the devil is. Um, it's conquering our own selves. It's 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 wrestling and balance. So, all right, we're gonna we're gonna keep it at that. Those th that's what the uh, those are the terms. Uh, the difference between colonialism, which is a tool and a mechanism of 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 putting others down, of keeping others down, of trying to like trying to conquer things. Imperialism is that bug. It's the disease. It's the infection. Of ambition itself beyond any color it's it's beyond visibility it's beyond the senses 
and it's it, what it, everybody is susceptible to it. Everybody is tempted and threatened by it. So that's imperialism. Um, and understanding, well, I won't, I won't add additional terms at the moment. Um, so we'll do, those, we'll do those three at the moment, and then we'll go to the fourth one. So we said native, or indigeneity, I know I'm saying a number of different terms for that, but uh, we'll just say with native, simple, native. Um, native, colonial, imperialism, and then the fourth one is plantation. So when we're talking about plantation, now we're talking about, um, it's a physical actuality a plantation is, but we're also talking about a mindset. And it is a mindset that is established through, yeah, actually, yeah. All right, so it's a mindset that is established through the specific phenomenon of colonialism, haha. -ha. So I'll try to break that down very simply and, 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 and comparatively concisely. What we're saying is that, uh, so I'll get, we'll talk about the temporal because that might be the best, a, a solid frame of reference to build from. Because we're talking about an actual, a physical actuality, but then even further, we're talking about an abstract mentality that is derived from that physical actuality. And that's where the, and that's where this focus is because at the moment, people can be like, hey, no plantations right now, but still people are living off of plantation mentality is what I'm saying, is what we're saying. So let's talk about the, like the basics of what that is. Plantation, we talk about um, people, particularly it's an agricultural uh, phenomenon historically uh, uh, for centuries, not just in the United States, but around the Western Hemisphere, particularly in the, in the experience of the enslavement of native people as well as Africans. That becomes the prominent um, kind of a poster example of what of a plantation is. So it's basically a house or, or a series of houses uh, where um, the, the 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 enslaving kinfolk live and uh, bring on slaves to work the land to grow crops, tobacco, cotton, sugar, uh, and otherwise. Um, and so the slaves live in slave quarters on the plantation. Uh, there are their hands and that, that they're Plantation is a big operation. By and large, at least in the United States, most of the people who own slaves own like small, lived in small cabins, were small people, and own like one or two slaves, and that's it. A plantation is a big production. It's, it has a big house where the where the, where the enslaving people live. Then it has uh, the accommodations where the workers live, in terms of like the uh, the slave drivers, the people who worked for the slave, the enslavers, but were not necessarily slaves themselves. Uh, or oneself. And then uh, the third category would be actually the slaves who lived in, in meager accommodations like cattle, and there might be accommodations for cattle. Put that in this nearby category because that's officially the law today. <clears throat> if we talk about, if we just, if we reduce, actually, wow, that's actually, wow, that's rather, um, it's actually very powerful to be honest, uh, thinking about that. The, for, the caste system of the United States is the, is the caste system of the plantation to this day. Talked about it before, it's four tiers. It is, um, ha, ha, wow. E. So the four tiers are people of European ancestry who own land, not not a house here. We're talking about huge land. So everybody who thinks they, they're like a landowner because they own, they have the title to their own house or whatever, nah, that's not it. We're talking about huge land. And at this point, it's corporations that own, own the huge, huge lands by and large. Even family corporations are still have to play that game. So, ain't, to be honest, maybe ain't no owners at this point because everybody's living that delusion of, of indebtedness. Anyways, that's supposed to be the first, the, high, the first category, the first class or caste. The second class is person in debt. So in this, in this scenario of the plantation, the people in debt would be the slave owners. They would be the ones on salary. They, be, they, they, don't, own the, they don't own the land. They don't own, quote unquote, own the slave. Ain't nobody own that. Ain't nobody own nothing. But no, they don't claim to own that. They work for the, the enslavers. Uh, and, and have a little bit of a better livelihood, but still aren't much higher than the slaves themselves. That's the second caste to this day. That's the law of the land. The third caste is the no, the no part of society, the subhuman. A little bit, no, equal to cattle. Um, Three-fifths of a human being, those are the slaves, live in the slave quarters. Uh, and those are different quarters than what the first and the second tier have. Uh, and then the fourth category, how about this? Here's, here's a flip the script type of situation. The fourth category, officially according to the US Constitution, is native people that count for nothing. Literally, still the law of the land. Why you don't talk about, people don't talk about native people. And if they do, it's bullshit that they're talking about. So it's, it's constitutional, it's the law of the land at this very moment that native people are zero. 
African slaves are three-fifths, natives are zero. All of whom, both of whom I should say, are not part of the fold, are outside of the fold. The only people in the fold are the first and second. Everybody else is outside. That's the law of the land today. Bump what you heard or what you say otherwise. That's the law of the land. Everything else is pimp talk. So we see that again in, in, the, in the example, the historic example of the plantation. The, the, the slave and slavers live in the big house. The people who work the slaves, um, the Europeans who work the slaves, are live in meager accommodations, maybe off the plantation or otherwise, but it's meager accommodations. The slaves live in, in, in stables on the plantation. And then the fourth category, rather than natives, because the natives have been cleared generally off the plantation because there's no purpose. The natives have already been killed off in that respect immediately around the plantation. So the fourth category is actually animals, the stables where people live, or stables where the animals live, the cattle, the cows, pigs, sheep, chickens, and additionally, that's the fourth category because that's the mentality and that's the law. Uh, and that's what a plantation is. So a plantation is the big operation, the agricultural operation with the slaves and additionally. So um, today, society is not, agri society is not agrarian. Um, society has lost that sense of connection with nature and where, where the, the, the nutrients, where the fruits and vegetables come from. I'm being scoped by, by an auntie, interestingly enough. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, that's what a plantation is. Uh, and and uh, when we talk about plantation today, it's perceived in a historic way because, wait a minute, there are no plantations now. If there are any plantations, they're all museums or, or whatever else. Um, and like that, that doesn't happen today. Um, if you actually look at a lot of the, the well, there are still big agricultural endeavors. They're corporate, um, often utilizing migrant labor, immigrant labor, uh, slave labor. Um, and otherwise, but it's not called plantations these days. It's called something else. So what we're talking about at this moment, when we say plantation, we're talking about that mindset because it beca back in the days, 200 years ago and further, it was huge. It was the thing. Like people talk about corporations today or people talk about banks or people even talk about nations today. And that day, people didn't even talk about nations too tough, to be honest. People weren't even talking about the United States because the United States was young, young acting, and otherwise not proved itself what didn't even exist when the plantations exist so what are you talking about nations it was the kingdom is feudalism the plantations become a prominent uh, fixture in the mindset of people during those times like corporations and banks and nations today uh, and that becomes the frame of reference and it also becomes the 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 foundation of security of the stability of economy the stability of security well-being, um, being fed, and additionally. So even the slaves get that, that Stockholm syndrome of like, yo, you know, we, get, we, we, don't, we don't got it so nice and it's not equal and it's not fair, but at least, you know, we know where to expect the violence from or we know where at least we got some food or whatever else. And so people grow attached and dependent upon the plantation. And even when people are recognized that they're being done wrong, oppressed, abused, tortured, and afflicted, kept ignorant, uh, prohibited from education, prohibited from practicing one's own religion and spirituality and, and honoring one's own ancestors, praying and worshiping one's own God. Even those, those things are being, um, those atrocities are being committed on a plantation. People are still attached to the plantation mentally uh, because people are so fearful of the consequences of going off the plantation, of, of disagreeing or disobeying what the plantation says. So it becomes a domesticated mindset, the plantation is. And so when we talk about plantation today, that definition, that term, is referencing the woeful, excessive domestication of people. And it's increasingly along the lines of nationalism where people just promote this, this sense of patriotism, of loyalty, and additionally to a nation, um, and have this very 
narrow-mindedness of anything outside of that nation, even one's own ancestry, one's own roots, and otherwise. It's a, it's a self-hatred, it's a hatred towards the others and, and foreignness, and it's all, also a hatred towards one's own self, because everybody, 99% of the people here, come from someplace else. So uh, when there is that hatred and that animosity towards anything outside of the nationalism, that's, all, that's intrinsically and, and uh, absolutely a hatred towards oneself, all right? Uh, and so that's the plantation mentality. And people are so dependent upon that. People are so fearful, become, become belligerent and militant when something is said about that, even facts, not even in a hateful way. Whenever somebody says anything disparaging about the plantation masses, oh, you, what you're talking about, you Benedict Arnold, da 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 no kind of sense no kind of sense it's narrow-minded blinders are on um and uh, that's the mentality now there's different levels of severity in terms of the mentality but that's what we're addressing when we're talking about plantation it's that domestication uh and people not even looking at how at one's own roots one people self-hate self disconnect from ancestors and relations and nature in order to to just stay comfortable comparatively speaking on the plantation safe uh, and otherwise because if people do start to question if people do start speaking truth and and challenge the precepts and the bullshit of the plantation oh is is consequences and repercussions so says the Hollywood shuffle so anyways that's the four things uh, and again it's it's the tangible but it's also the abstract um, now, that being said, we're going to just flow into the fifth thing, um, which is, is we're, on, we're, on the, we're in the momentum. So the fifth thing is this. People might see us as being enemies. People might see us as being foreigners, of, of, of aligning ourselves with foreigners when we talk about China, when we talk about Islam, when we talk about Judaism, when we talk about India, when we talk about Buddhism, when we talk about anything that is not Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman, English, American, then it is doctrinally de jure and de facto perceived as foreignness, as enemy, with the ebbs and flows of the political cycles, depending upon trade advantages and otherwise at that moment trends if there's a new discovery oh we got to be friends with these enemies so let's let's quiet that up for a minute and then when we've gotten what we can get or what we think we can get from that exchange okay now let's talk about them again plain that's just plain politics and the, the sheeple as, as brethren bob marley proclaims the sheep will just follow along with that and then become further um uh domineering and telling other sheeple what to do or 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 telling other people to be sheeple and obey what, what, what the plantation tells the sheeple to do. And and that and things just become further deteriorated. So anyways, the point being here is this. The term the term we're addressing here, huh? Yo, that plane is making a hard bank. It's a huge plane flying hugely low with a huge angle. Pronounced. Um what we're talking about here is obliteration. When we talk about anything outside of the country, uh, of the United States, the, the theater of the United States, when we talk about anything about that, we're perceived as enemy. It's been that way for a long time, for over 20 years of my life, at least. Um, and we get accused of all different types of crazy, oh, they're just crazy. Either either uh, betrayal, oh, how, how is he going to disrespect our society, our leadership, and everything else like that, our clergy, da 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 uh, And then when there's some knowledge, that how is he going to disrespect all the investment that's put been put in him oh, I'm saying him I'm, I'm not being so individualistic and personalized um, I should not be so greedy in, in, in assuming uh, the, the, the the reception of such criticism uh, so it's a collective uh, such kinfolk are accused of being unappreciative disrespectful of the investments that are pr provided in such kinfolk for not abiding by the the propaganda and otherwise um, so again it's it's uh it's lightweight blasphemy it's lightweight betrayal then it gets to be oh like apologetic oh they're just crazy they don't know what they're talking about don't don't hate them just feel sorry for them and da 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 uh and then when is when there's this perceived oh, what you is what you is a moth all right 
a little bit shy. I didn't want to be video, but light color, whitish, beigeish, moth type kinfolk. Um, this is my dental inspection because I don't have my tooth. Oh, I need a floss. I need to do a whatever else. Anyways, um, blasphemy, betrayal, and then oh, they're just crazy. And then when there's there's a perception of like resilience and even efficacy and actually influence within others, oh, then it becomes threatening. And then it becomes oh, we're gonna have to do something. So. Watch the fingers and the rubbing in public, particularly when on the ground. Uh, so, the point here is this. We're not enemies. We don't hate anybody. We're not at anybody. We, have, we are obligated. We are committed. We vow to live a discipline that abstains from initiating violence on anyone. And even when defending ourselves, we are extremely limited in how we can defend ourselves. We don't have Gatling guns that obliterate the field of soldiers and enemy or, or, or uh, hostiles against us. We don't have that. We do have protocols and technology and methodologies of being proactive. And the proactivity is extremely diplomatic and disciplined, being modest and otherwise. We took, communicate all this very frequently point is this, just for people to recognize, plain and simple, plain and simple, here it is. We stand between you and obliteration. We stand between you, civilization, society, and obliteration. Specifically society. Civilization continues on one way or the other. But the societies of the day, uh, the nations of the day, the conventions of the day, we stand between you and obliteration. You are on a course of self-obliteration. You need no help in that. You need no enemy in that. You're doing it to yourself. We are communicating that to you to help in your well-being. When you get at us, you lessen, you reduce the effectiveness of our service of keeping obliteration at bay from you. We're not threatening you. We're not hostile to you. We're not hateful towards you. We're not antagonistic towards you. We are committed, we have a, a solemn, sacred, holy vow to genuinely and optimally promote the well-being of all life on this earth and in this universe, including human life, humanoid life, all life, all our relatives, all our relations. We're not at you. We're not your enemy. We're, we stand between you and obliteration. What we share to the best of our ability is a communication of what is happening what happens before and what continues to happen from this moment based upon what we, all of us, do, say, and think. What we share is with the intention of healing and well-being. We have to be honest. We have to call things out. Just like a doctor, you don't want a doctor to sugarcoat things when, you, when you're trying to find out what's going on with your body. You don't want a, a doctor just giving you, just being a yes person and just saying, oh yeah, you can keep on doing whatever you want to do. You know, you can eat whatever you want to eat. No, you don't have to exercise if you don't want to exercise. Yeah, you keep on just watching TV and sitting down and not doing anything if you want to. That's no problem. We'll find another way. That's what, that's what you expect from doctors right now because the way doctors do it is just by popping pills. But the, the, the actual truth is, yo, get the fuck up off your ass and get some exercise. Stop eating all that bullshit, poison. And otherwise, but when people say that, and that was a little bit, that was a little bit harsh language and everything. But when people suggest that, then then people are accused of being authoritarian. Oh, you can't tell us what to do. You're imposing on, you're imposing on our. Fine, but the point is that the advice itself. We, I mean, obviously, we have to we have to communicate it in respectful ways. But we are.
medicine. Oh, they, with all that, with all that harsh language, we are medicine, and we are healers. We are medicine and healers for civilization. And we stand between society and obliteration. We're not perfect, and we are—we have our susceptibilities. We do the best we can, just like everybody else is. But just to plainly understand, when you come at us, when you when you infringe upon us doing our work, when you threaten us, when you tempt us, and otherwise, you are deterring us or distracting us. from the service that we are providing for you. We stand between you and obliteration. You can witness the obliteration in the upcoming generation. The nihilism, the annihilation, that's another way of describing it. We stand between you and annihilation. It's not, okay, that's what it is. That's maybe a better, clear way of describing it. You, China is not your enemy. Talking to America, China is not your enemy. India is not your enemy. Israel is not your enemy. Islam is not your enemy. Latinos coming from the South are not your enemy. Europeans, white folk are not your enemy. Police are not your enemy. The gangsters aren't your enemy. What uh? The thing that threatens you most at this moment is annihilation. Even the tiptoe steps towards annihilation. Individually and collectively. The behavior is your enemy. The behavior within yourselves is your enemy. And that is what is guiding you into annihilation. That's in the big bombs shock and all way. That is in the microscopic, silent, viral way. You see the evidence already. People are being mentally annihilated. People who are the smart, genius, fast, mental wheels workers being drones can't focus and concentrate without having a device can't hold a conversation can't keep attention for longer than 30 seconds can't keep a positive healthy thought for 30 minutes those are symptoms and precursors of annihilation individually and collectively. Car accidents, heart disease, suicide, suicide. The leading causes of death in society being self afflictions. That is annihilation, doing it to yourselves. We are not your enemy. Pedophilia, sexual exploitation, human trafficking, indebtedness, class apartheid, domestic predatoriness, hostilities, passive aggressive, and direct aggressive hostilities on the streets and otherwise. Annihilation. doing it to yourselves and we are charged in stemming stemming meaning stopping 
minimizing the annihilation. We're not trying to conquer nothing. We, we are prohibited from trying to conquer anything or from actually conquering anything. We can't. This truth, this path is beyond the realm of conquering. Conquering is antithetical to this path. It's, it's not, it's, that's not, it ain't happening. That's not what this is. If we ever endeavor conquest, conquering our ownership, we are abandoning that path. That's what that is. So this is the path. When we are tempted, when we are threatened or whatever else, the path continues. The path is inevitable. You can, you can target the, 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 the travelers along the path. That doesn't stop the path. And it doesn't stop the work and the product of the path. So our, our purpose is sharing truth, peace and balance. All right? And being honest about that as best we can. We're not the enemy. We're not your enemy. We don't hate you. We're not trying to come at you. We're not trying to punish you. We're not trying to show you a lesson in return. We are tempted. And even when we're presented opportunities, it's tempting because we're, we, are, we are earthly beings and so we're susceptible to the, the same weaknesses as others. We're not better than or worse than anybody else. We walk the most high. Elohim, God, known by many names and beyond all names. We are tempted, but that's not what we're here for. When cats do things to us, what we recognize is it's all a pledge process. It's all coming from the Most High, Elohim. When cats test us, when cats do passive-aggressive, when cats do things to our loved ones, and additionally, it's all the devil tempting us to react and respond with similar hostility and get enveloped in that murky pool <clears throat> of selfishness, of greed, hatred, and delusion. So we do our best to be disciplined and mindful and balanced on our deem as best can be amidst the temptations. And when we go through that, for better or worse, when we make amends, when we, when we slip, but when we get through those temptations and those trials and tribulations, we recognize it's all a pledge process. It's all a pledge process for a higher, or for a further, we, we could say a higher uh, state of being. That is eventual and inevitable for each being. We, we step in faith on that. With all thanks and praise to the Most High. Oh, the crows, the crows, them, them crows. I don't know if that was visible, but indeed, indeed, indeed. So, all right. Um, so those are the five, those are the four terms in the fifth one, which is just obliteration. We're not anybody's enemy. And understand the mechanics of how the atrocities are being committed today. And again, going back to citizenship. Now we're off the five. We're going into further combo. But understand citizenship and recognize how every citizen is exactly responsible for each atrocity that the collective does. If you think about it, like just recognize the United States is a cult. Uh, it starts. It starts at a, a long time ago. Peace and blessings, bro. It starts a long time ago, but it's a cult, and it recruits and it becomes increasingly prosperous to the point where it's a, a very heavily populated cult but at the same time just like with a cult it has its rituals it has its exclusivities and it has its atrocities it has its blood thirsts it has its sex thirsts um and it has its mechanisms for recruiting and perpetuating itself it's about take um and every citizen that every citizen is, 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 is part of that. Every citizen is responsible for it because that's the premise of citizenship. Everybody accepts that citizenship and the benefits that are provided for it. And in doing that, the person also accepts the consequences, the guilt. And that's a, it's, a, it's a ritual. 18 years old, sign up for citizenship. That's initiation into the cult of America. Official, formal, legal corruption in signing up onto the cult and all the corruptions that the cult does, 18 years old, which is actually very late in life. 
Um, I won't get into that one. There's a lot of there's a lot of preceding corruption that teachers, family, clergy, community leaders do to prepare youngsters to become citizens. To just like this is what is done. Um, but that's the formal entry into the corruption of of the American cult. Uh, and then it becomes pervasive around the world within the past century. So now it's it's increasingly a world norm. But it's 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 again, uh, it's unsustainable. And and um, we work towards facilitating the optimal experience of well-being amidst the continuing unfolding of civilization and the evolution from the construct of the American theater. Um, see what else we share here we've been here for about an hour nearly um, this is the first time doing something like this here uh, I'm, I live two blocks away from here grow up two blocks away from here um, I work <laughs> the building is no longer here but I'm looking directly where it used to be actually probably right there um, but that's my first full-time, well not full-time, but my first part-time job, paycheck, uh, right here. So, but all that being said, uh, this is the first time recording here. Um, so the energy is different, it's interesting, there's obviously a lot, of ener a lot of activity, a lot of movement with the vehicles, the traffic. We are at traffic hour at this point. Um, and, uh... The vibe is different. It's different than the Wi-Fi spot. Um, interesting. In, in certain ways, it's not as like like hostile because where the Wi-Fi spot is, to be honest, and love and peace for everything all around. But at the Wi-Fi spot, there's like a very latent, quiet hostility as well as love and support. It's both, but it's intense because people know me. Even when just seeing a glance at me, people know me, what I'm about, for better and for worse. And without saying anything to me, there's the weight of that of that consciousness. Uh, here, it may be that fewer people have that same kind of familiarity with me. You might just see me and just like, oh, this is some dude doing something else. But at the same time, there's probably few people who have as much belonging here as I do, even if people have lived here for the past 20 some odd years or whatever, um, don't know what, what this place looks like before that. So it's an interesting confluence of belonging um, from very different um, pretexts or, 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 or um, pretenses. So all that being said, part of the nature of this location is one of continuing movement uh, and a certain instability where it's difficult for anybody to call anybody out or to proclaim some type of propriety over others because everybody is a stranger here. Um, and so for me to do this, it's like, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't have that much of a vested interest. Let me go back to my comfortable house and just and, 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 and vibe in my own castle. So it's interesting that, because um, all the buildings I'm looking at at this exact moment did not exist 20 years ago. All these buildings did not exist. This gravel, this ledge that I'm sitting on, uh, even lightweight, this, this, uh, this grass behind me. The bus stop, well the actual edifice there did not exist. However, the bus stop actually think it did exist. Because actually, when I when I worked here over 20 years ago, this was a, it was a parking lot. It wasn't this parking lot, but it was it was another parking lot, a different gravel, and additionally, and the parking lot uh, actually uh, there was an exit over on, to the left where I'm sitting. Um, funny thing is, like first it was it was two exits. One 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 was like perpendicular to the street behind me, and then the other was perpendicular to the street that is uh, adjacent here. Those were the two exits, and there was a traffic light for each of those exits, um, and that was the way it was set up. Then, maybe about 20 years ago, all of that was changed, and the parking lot was reconfigured so that there was only one, I think it was just only one exit that went out diagonally into the intersection here, uh, which was rather unusual. Uh, but then, again, like I said, you can see it changes since then. The library... Um, that wasn't there before. The library was there before, but it didn't look like that. That's a recent renovation. So, and I'm not, just for the record, I'm not on online at the moment, I don't think. I don't want, I'm not on Wi-Fi, this is just recording. So I'm off, this, this is the offline zone of the week. We're on a Tuesday. I think it was a Tuesday. And 
I have to think about what that reference is. But anyways, so that was that's kind of like the the intermediate banter. That was like the intermission, the banter before getting into the next topic. Um, So there's something else to, fl to continue on with what I was saying before uh, before about the annihilation. I talk about some of the symptoms. I talk about um, I talk about the drone dronedness on devices, the, the difficulty of concentrating. I talk about the leading causes of death being self-inflicted, and like the people, the leadership, the political leaders, even the clergy, are extremely impotent, politically impotent, to do something systemically about it because the mechanics of the the governing governing or government machinery uh, are so convoluted and so obstructive from getting anything done uh, it becomes so difficult to do even things that are just so plain and simple it all becomes politicized and even when it's plain and simple then people try to attach their own personal agenda to it because they know it's plain and simple that's i mean literally that's how that's how uh, legislation works when a bill is about to be passed and people know that it's about to be passed then certain of the hierarchy of the, within the, the the Congress or the senatorship um, does its endeavor to um, to attach their own little line items to that bill, um, and those line items tend to be uh, different types of um, uh, funding for s private programs. They're 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 key um, uh, lobbyists and 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 and, and p campaign contributors. When it's known that okay, this bat, this bill is going to pass. This is very mundane. Maybe it's it's the, uh, the it's the budget bill or something like that. This one's got uh, the budget bill is not the best example, but it's a mundane like low key. There's no big issue on this particular bill, and it's pretty much agreed. Like all the senators, every uh, all the Congress are going to pass or whatever. And so because of that, whoever is hosting the bill or whoever has some kind of access to the bill, then attaches certain little minor things that are not going to be a question. We're not going to bring it to public attention. We're just going like we're just going to quietly pass this on. That's how things get done. When it becomes something that is a big issue, uh, it's going to be further contentious amongst 300 million people, or allegedly 300 million people, um, and thus it's not going to. Nothing's going to happen. There's very little. It's, it's stagnancy. A lot of static. A lot of a subterfuge. Meanwhile, okay, pass this one. Pass this one. Pass this one. And then, again, stagnancy. So point is that to do even the things that are needed within society there's going to be disagreement about what that is and even when there's agreement about what that is then it's a disagreement about how much of a priority is that is and meanwhile it don't get done so meanwhile suicide is still a leading cause of death car accidents which you see behind me i'm not trying to conjure it at this moment car accidents are a leading cause of death that is nonsensical if any other foreign nation china india i've said this so many times china india islam israel Mexico, Latino, Europeans, Africans, if any other group that's perceived as a foreigner and an enemy was causing the amount of deaths and injury, casualties, the loss of economy, jobs, permanent injury, and additionally, if any other entity aside from the United States itself was doing that to, to the United States, that is, that's warfare. Shock and awe, bombs would be obliterating lands, devastating, turning lands into actual deserts because that's how powerful the military is to respond to those threats. How powerful is the military at responding to the leading causes of death within the United States? Powerless, impotent, nothingness. And that's the state of psychosis within society ready to go to arms and obliterate any quote-unquote enemy. Meanwhile, the devastation, the corruption, the annihilation is growing and growing within. And it's right in people's faces, right in broad daylight, and kinfolk are paralyzed to do it because kinfolk are so attached to the atrocities of those things to keep it going. And when people start to talk about it, that starts to rock the boat. That is a pirate ship. Uh, and uh, one other thing I'll share on that, along those lines is I've said this, I've shared this story before, but um, it's, it, I'm, to be honest, maybe one reason I'm sharing this because I'm still processing this, like seeing what, what to do about this. But before, I, what I haven't shared before is like uh, 
a preceding a preceding experience. So about over 20 years ago um, when I'm in law school, I have a lot of law school stories because this life and that's probably when I'm the most social in my life, actually, to be honest, uh, and, and have fewer regular social anecdotes. I have many social anecdotes after law school, but it's it's like here and there because that's the nature of the interaction by and large since graduating from law school. Um, so anyways, a lot of my my stories come from, from law school experience, not just law school, but, but college, high school, and all the frames of reference of education, studying abroad, um, business school, middle school, private school, all that stuff. So anyways, this one's from law school. And it actually happens to be that I was visiting um, one of my brethren, uh, house mate, roommate, uh, study mate from, from Africa, um, who was also a law student, but he was, he was uh, out in, in, in NYC, in Mohawk land, uh, during that time over 20 years ago. We were visiting with one of his few friends that he knows from, from a long time ago. And that friend is uh, like uh, doing things in the artist scene in, in, in New York City. I uh, had like a theater production on off Broadway, da 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 da, and was talking about that. And so, you know, we smoke out, we're just chilling out, I'm visiting for the weekend or whatever for a few days, sleeping on a couch and appreciating the hospitality. Um, and I remember one time we were just walking through the city or whatever, and, and the kinfolk are talking about what the kinfolk are doing and like just talking about craft and honing craft and um, like continuing to like to cultivate that and be devoted to that and um, to recognize value within oneself for doing that and accordingly and I remember just very clearly to this day I remember looking at the brethren and I'm looking at the brethren's eyes and I, it just the eyes were black the eyes just looked like like the brethren was full of life in terms of talking and, and talking about doing it, very intelligent uh, intimidating intelligence and seeing like it's an intimidating like efficacy in, in terms of his craft or what he's doing and showing the product of what he's doing it's for me just coming out of law school like what am i doing um i had less interest of, of like uh of doing what he was doing per se so it wasn't a jealousy but there was an intimidation like yo he's he's in the big scene new york city theater art craft da 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 okay so respecting that a little bit intimidated but then i was just looking at his eyes and it was just like i saw like blackness in his eyes and i'm smoking out so you know things might get exaggerated or whatever but i was just kind of like looking at his eyes and he might have like saw me i wasn't trying to like be all stereo or whatever but he saw me and he was just like he mentioned on his own something about like like yeah like there's death in these eyes or something like that and that's what i was thinking i wasn't trying to say that i wasn't trying to oppose that i was trying to reconcile with that because i wasn't trying to i wasn't trying to wish that or anything i was just trying to understand like the, like process like what is that um and that's what i was thinking and he spoke to that and i was into me like oh we i'm already used to kinfolk like kind of like already figuring me out in that respect so okay there it is um but like i wasn't i wasn't trying to conjure that and i think he could see that and wasn't and knew that like i wasn't trying to do but like i was just trying to what, what, what's going on um and then we just continued with the conversation and continued on or whatever smoke some herb um and, and try to heal as much as possible so that was over 20 years ago or whatever and there are a few there it's difficult for me to think of another occasion when it was that pronounced that kind of experience i mean people have all different types of colors of eyes from dark 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 to light 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 and it's all beauty it's all light we appreciate it and even there's there's even when i was looking at his eyes there's still light there's a vibrancy and it's evident through what he's sharing um and and there's appreciation we give thanks and praise to the most high for that and blessings for continuing that light in this life so that's that that being said again this past year i have the occasion of being in a particular spot where there's just it was in the midst of challenging circumstances like woeful um cultural prostitution where people of a certain ilk congregate and uh it's it's a ritualistic it's a low-key it's a cultish thing but it's in public so um but children get recruited into it and additionally and it is the same grounds where there is pedophilia and, and child trafficking and sex trafficking right there in that exact spot um and so and actually that event is kind of like a lightweight a staging uh, event for those types of that type of culture and that type of scene and that type of aesthetic and that helps to at least at the very least cause a blur and a confusion about what's going on so those are the exact conditions that i find myself just to get in terms of getting some wi-fi and additionally so uh as i am as i'm sitting there doing what i do uh and like trying to keep a distance as much as possible from the kinfolk um i mentioned this before i shared this story before uh as i'm sitting there 
I see that there's a, a brethren younger than myself, maybe in his early 30s, uh, he, and he he's bare chested. It ain't hot that day, but you know people do what people do. But it's again, it's a family gathering, a lot of children around, um, and this is this is. I already described what the grounds are. It's cultural prostitution. It's the grounds of child trafficking. Uh, it might not be other than the actual activity at that moment, but it's a staging ground of, of introductions and, and for creating aesthetics. So admit to that and being very frustrated about that because calling anybody out, it's not the most effective way of dealing with it in our estimation. So when seeing that, I just try to keep a distance about it because that's the place to go to effectively that's available to catch the Wi-Fi in those kind of conditions. And so um, that's where I am. And when I when I'm just sitting there, whatever, here comes a young a little girl, a little niece, maybe two years old, petite, small, pretty, pretty young girl, two years old. And I see her already, I see her. She's going up to the, everybody and just saying hi. And like you don't want to discourage that because you want children to be loving and additionally but at the same time knowing what those conditions are even if it's not that I, you can um, you can see like there's people that are there are predators in the midst uh, and any parent who has like two eyes and honesty and honest heart two eyes and an honest heart knows and sees the predators so to allow a child just to go indiscriminately or presumably indiscriminately to each and every of the adults, each of the males, and just say hi. Again, you don't want that. Like if it's a shul, if it's like a synagogue or whatever, or a, a church or a masjid or a gurdwara, and you know the people there are at least safe and or accountable, like we know people who know the, that person or whatever, then there's a further freedom and, and, and like comfort in allowing a child to feel free and just talk with the adults. Because everybody in that particular setting is safe or accountable effectively however when it's a public space you don't know who's there you don't know the people's names you don't know where they come from you don't know what they're about to let a child just walk around to men grown men middle-aged men young men who are not saying come here or whatever else and the girl is doing it on her own that's that's imprudent. I'm just going to say it's imprudent at the very least. And that's not shade on, on the children, but it's, it becomes a question like, Yo, what are the parents doing here to allow their, their child to work like that? Um, and some parents are like, Yo, this is their one time off of work to be able to be spend child time with the children. They're not trying to worry about anything because this is what they got. This is all they got. And they're trying to make the child have as much brightness and happiness. We know that. And it's, it's nasty circumstances. But that's what we're talking about. And so anyways, at that moment, knowing those conditions as it is, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't acknowledge the girl at all initially uh, as she's approaching the other dudes. I'm sitting there just doing my work. Um, I'm not trying to say, hey, little girl, how you doing? Da, 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 da. I'm not doing anything to inv invite that kind of interaction because I don't want her to feel comfortable in just approaching dudes in that space, even myself. Now, that being said, whenever I see anybody, I say hi. If I see a child by, by the child's self, I say hi. And I generally keep it at that and I keep going or keep doing whatever I'm doing. Um, very often, the children are coming to me and, and saying hi to me and in and, and all different kinds of situations. So anyways, um, that being said, on that particular occasion, she says hi to everybody else. Um, and then eventually, she didn't immediately come to say hi to me, but eventually she does. And when she does, she's a pretty little girl smiling uh, and saying hi. But at the same time, when I see her, I'm just being honest. When I see her, I just see big eyes. And she looks literally like a doll. She looks like a doll. Because it's a bright, pretty girl. But it's just like a blank, a blank look. And I look at her eyes and I'm reminded of the situation with the brethren from New York City. And I'm trying not to, I'm not trying to pose that. I'm not trying to like imply that even just how I respond to her. Because I don't want her to think that. I don't want her to think that about anyone, let alone about herself. So I try to... Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to play into it because I know she's reading everything. She sees everything. Girls are extre are genius beyond any what anyone can understand and know all that's going on. Might reveal a little bit about what the girls know to who, it, who to whom it is trusted. But the girls see everything. And if they if a girl sees me just being okie doke like everybody else, then she says, "Oh, that's another that's another soft one. That's another like pushover. We can't trust in him. Uh, he's just one of them and everything else like that." So nah, so I can't just be okie doke and pretend like I don't see what's going on and everything else. But at the same time, I don't want to 
impose it. I don't want to uh, uh, suggest it other uh, suggest conditions otherwise. So, and I don't have a lot of pre pre uh, um, calculated like um, uh, script or whatever in that type of scenario. So I just I just did what naturally occurs to me, which is when she does finally approach me, I'm sitting down. She approaches me. We're looking almost eye to eye because she, she, maybe she's still even a little bit smaller. I see her eyes. I see her pretty. She's smiling, and, and she's just, and she just says hi. Uh, and I might have just given her a blank look initially, and then it might have caused her some pause. Um, and then, uh, actually, I have to think about this now. She did repeat it. She just like she was undeterred. Like she was going to get a response from me. She wasn't going to just just let me not do anything. So then she says again, hi. Like she, I could see whatever I did at first. I think. I think I might have said nothing at first, and I might have just looked at her, and I might have given not not in a mean look, but like not like a happy go lucky or whatever else. I kind of might have just kind of stared at her or something to let her know, like I know I'm I'm acknowledging the circumstances is not copacetic. I'm not an okie doke one, um, and I don't want to I don't want to scare, I don't want to hurt or otherwise. But I know like this isn't this isn't healthy right now, and I'm just trying to convey that just by like, giving like a blank look. Um, and she's undeterred, and so she says again, "Hi," and I, you know what? That might have been that might have been it. Okay, I think that's what it was. All right. So what I actually did was this: when she says hi the first time, I might have said, "Boo." That was my way. Of doing it. I know I said "boo." I was thinking about that, but actually, what I think it was is that the first thing I said was "boo." I didn't say "hi." I didn't say "peace and blessings." It was the first. It was it was my like natural thing of trying to like let her know, like, "Yo, there's healthier things than what you're doing right now." But I can't say it because I see whoever is your your male authority figure over there with the bear shirt and everything else like that obviously he knows what you're doing and he's sanctioning it uh, but at the same time it's still unhealthy uh, so anyways she comes up to me she says hi I say boo and then uh, then undeterred and I just look at her didn't say anything else and then she just says again hi and then that's when I probably said hi or peace and blessings or something to that to, uh, to her accordingly because at that point I'm feeling bad because if I'm if, if I'm trying to be my my kindest and most supporting and additionally okay do that but at the same time if I'm saying boo that ain't the most healthy either and even if it's not sent with malice still like it's still left to ambiguity and interpretation and confusion so peace and blessings to you and I could have said that at the beginning but I was to be honest I was frustrated with the conditions generally speaking and so to see her was just very very um, frustrating for myself and not having something better to respond to that proactively so Anyways, and, I, and then I was extremely humbled by her resilience of just pausing and staying there and saying hi again, like like when, like an angel, like, I'm going to give you another try. I'm going to give you another opportunity to, like, come correct. And so to this day, it's something, like, it's, it's only a recent memory, but, like, it's one of those ones, like, from 20 years ago, has that kind of staying power. And, and, and part of the staying power is, like, what to do, what to talk, what to say to a child who has those eyes that have seen devastation and annihilation and are looking desperately for protection and guidance in this life whether it's two years old or it's 12 years old or it's 20 years old I encounter each of those on a regular basis by the grace of the Most High and I do my best to respond and there's only so much I can do personally there's only so much we can do um, so part of what we do here is share and, and, and let it be known for the record uh, for those who have the interest and the inclination so um, point there and point here is I gotta find appropriate seating arrangement because the block is hot and the rock is uh, the stone is hard there's a better way of saying that anyways um, point for that story and additionally is is like what what is evidence within the sister the young Nisi at that moment is the annihilation whatever she's seen whatever her her father figure and additional kinfolk have um, exposed her to um, I don't want to conjure it I don't want to presume it but I actually don't want to avoid it either uh, whatever it is I, I, I see I see certain pain and, and it's not just within her it's it's with other because because many girls and, and many children are extremely skillful at masking things um, many people are extremely skilled at masking things 
So the annihilation that I'm speaking of is the annihilation that precipitates uh, the self-affliction. And it is a direct and blatant annihilation. It is also a very subtle and eventual annihilation. It is an, it is a nihilism. And that is the pervading enemy for America today. The nihilism within the emerging generation. And we're not talking about the, the seventh generation of electricity. We're talking about the first generation of the Black Buddha. It is a nihilism that doesn't care. That, that, that perceives a meaninglessness within life. Um, the preceding generation, the seventh generation of electricity, has a nihilism. And, and by that we're talking about like 20 year olds, thereabouts, teenagers, um, and otherwise. Has a nihilism of not even knowing what, what healthy is, not even knowing what the proper balance is. Um, but that nihilism still has a semblance of malice. And ironically, in that malice, there is some semblance of hope, redemption, teshuva, and otherwise. Because in that malice, in that anger, there is a, at least some semblance of a recognition or some recognition of a semblance of balance, of right and wrong. Uh, and so even though it may not be as informed as the preceding generation of rebellion and, and, uh, and listlessness, um, and our generation of self-righteous and self-indignant righteousness or whatever, the seventh generation of electricity is a nihilism that, that has still like a latent malice to it that recognizes at the very least a right and wrong. Whereas what we observe within the seventh generation of the Buddha, in addition, in, 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 in addition to the solutions and, and the seeds of, of um, teshuv and repentance amongst, amongst the generation, what we observe is like an increasing nihilism that doesn't even have malice. It's robotic. It doesn't. It doesn't. It has less of a semblance of balance to even see right and wrong. It's 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 almost a rote equation of pain and pleasure, with increasingly immediate frames of reference, and not even looking at long term. So, um, and that's what the enemy is for kinfolk who live in their enclaves, in their gated communities, in their uh, cul-de-sac suburbs, uh, outer ring suburbs, in addition, because it's a nihilism that manifests itself within the interior, within the media, it, per, it proliferates through the media, uh, through just the, the hedonistic, uh, the highly civilized and hedonistic culture, uh, drugs, sex, and sausage rolls, um, and it becomes uh, manifested beyond all the walls and moats and um, protections that convention and hierarchy it endeavors to establish to protect its progeny. We're not wishing that, we're not promoting that, we're not threatening that, we're communicating that. And that's what the enemy is. And it's coming from people's own behavior and attachment to the trappings of corruption. <clears throat> and the annihilation of others, the conquest of others, the enslavement of others, the atrocity against others. It manifests itself into the nihilism within one's own progeny. So, um, don't have to scale any walls. Don't have to send any bombs. Uh, it, it, it's self-annihilation. And that's what we're standing between. Society and obliteration. So, um... To be honest, there, uh, there's little reasoning about this um, because those who know about what's happening either are positioned to continue doing it or positioned, are positioned to, to resist it. Um, otherwise, the people in between are comparatively oblivious and are increasingly obtuse towards even considering the reason. Youth 
have increasing propensity for for reasoning and, and like processing, learning, and and, and, and a, a, absorbing and adjusting accordingly, um, whatever truth we're, that's within what we share. But by and large, once kinfolk get into the machine, once kinfolk get into the grind, they don't have a vested interest in truth. They just have a vested interest in getting a bigger slice of whatever corruption and atrocities are being committed and that's it don't don't have an interest of truth or, or reason or rationale it's all a matter of like how is this going to give us a bigger slice that's it um so youth are the ones generally speaking who are further receptive and and and, and um have a greater propensity of processing and absorbing and utilizing this type of information and, and, and knowledge um but again, like I said, at age 18, once it becomes official, somebody gets signed on into the cult, there's less motivation. And there are further attachments to job or, or, or education, uh, schooling or whatever else. And so there's, as one becomes, uh, matures as one ages, there's less and less uh, motivation for having this kind of conversation, for, for listening to this kind of truth and otherwise. Many are affiliated with religious organizations, religious communities that have increasing uh, mindfulness and 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 uh, appreciation and, and uh, practice of truth but still are connected with with the, the trappings and the atrocities and so it's up to a certain point generally speaking that being said um, our guidance is not to conquer it's not for systemic change it's not for 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 globalized this that or the other it's for sharing what we know to build a community where we are as much as possible being married having children living as clans and tribes in a disciplined way, having a, 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 a positive affirmational relationship with the earth, the land, the environment around us that sustains us, that provides us our nourishment, having a proficient diplomatic relations with the other sentient beings, human and otherwise, that live on the land and share the land accordingly. Um, it's not for conquest. We, 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 are, we vow, we have relinquished ownership. We are prohibited from owning anything. We are prohibited from being politically aligned uh, with, through citizenship or other affiliations with, with the conventional authorities, militaries, or otherwise. We let those things go, and we let those protections go. We are not protected by that. We, can, we have the propensity of doing uh, treaties and negotiations, um, but we don't, we don't have that. Uh, we, are, we are prohibited from... Uh, aligning ourselves and pledging ourselves, pledging allegiance uh, to to uh, such entities. Um, so um, there's that. Um, we are not the enemy. Our objective is not to conquer anyone. It is not to take over or implement any kind of systemic anything. It is to attune ourselves with the nature and to articulate that knowledge as best we can through our own actions and then also through our words and thoughts. So, um, and we, we endeavor to um, meet uh, and address hostilities as peaceably and proficiently as possible uh, and such all right well I'm, I'm gonna get into the second the, the, the second realm of what I was sharing so I talked about the, the young sister and talked about the annihilation within within uh, within um, and uh, I try to get I tried actually that that last part of what I shared was basically an endeavor to share solution about like healing nature and additionally but that goes back to the first thing I should about native and indigeneity um, the, the 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 solution is very simple it's, it's the basic necessities water air land shade light seed that's that's where that that's where well-being exists and our individual well-being and our collective well-being um, is connected with the with those elements 
plants, animals, and additionally. That's what the solution is. It's very simple. And it's, it's a matter of recognizing what do we do that causes harm in each of these respects and thus to our own selves. And what do we do that is proactive in healing and promoting the well-being of the life around us, including our own selves. Um, that is that, that's, that's that simple. And the, the tough thing is letting go of those things that are harmful, that are unnecessary and harmful, that we put so much value into that's actually unfounded. Vehicles, big houses, social credentials that signify basically just exclusion without a lot of knowledge or information. Um, social relationship is important, uh, but much of the social relationships or the credentials are predicated upon exclusion uh, and comparatively arbitrary pretenses of exclusion um, that, that are significantly based upon other people's opinions, likes and dislikes, rather than um, Factors or foundations of phenomena um, beyond any in each individual, meaning ancestors, uh, language, culture, beliefs. So, songs, stories, rituals, ethics. That's where the healing is. Remember those things. We used to talk about that. Um, rivers, languages, and calendars. So, yeah. all right, now that being said, we are going to uh, address another situation of challenge and difficulty. Um, and we say this now, we're an hour and a half into this joint. Hmm. I, have to, I have to think about where this is going. Those look like sparrows moving rather fast. Hmm. I'm trying to figure out where this is going, what I'm about to share, so that it's that the purpose of it is further clear and effective, rather than just like venting or whatever, or even confessing. Well, I'm gonna go for it, um, and we'll see how it goes. We'll see where it goes, and who's around when when it goes. So, this is what it is. Um, I'm gonna start with a very provocative statement. Um, as I sit here by the sewer, uh, drains to waterways. Um, it reminds me of the sewer grate outside my prison cell window in Denmark just a couple years ago. I wrote a poem about it. No, it's not the time to joke. All right, here we go. This is our, I want to say something provocative, humor aside, all this other stuff. Is this. I am causing the sexual corruption of 14-year-old women. Full stop. Oh, excuse me. No, no, no. That's not, that's, not the, that's not the statement. This is the statement. I am causing, I am legally causing the sexual corruption of 14-year-old women. That's the statement. It's all legal. What am I talking about? <sighs> I've said it already before, actually. Um, when we look at when we observe the convention, the contemporary practice of presentation of young sister. You know, actually, the way I'll describe this, I'm actually going to articulate again where we come from in terms of why this is done. I'm not explaining all of it, but just where we come from. Like, why, how we within ourselves or what we within ourselves are wrestling or how we um, rationalize this. And it's not favorable, it's not favorable. Um, but we're working on concern, con discerning why this is and where it comes from. Um, 
and how to proceed towards something that is further healthy. So, all right. Okay, ah, yeah, okay, okay. All right, all right. I'm reminded of something specific, tangible, to, to include within this. So, God willing, I'll remember sharing this as part of this. So, basically, again, where we're we coming from. First of all, we have a different definition of, of what adulthood is compared to what conventional law is, what, what the U.S. law says and what other laws around the world say based upon their conformity with the United States law. Because in, in, in Europe, even a few years ago, the legal age of sex, sexual activity in Europe, a number of years ago, to my understanding, genuinely, is 16 years old. So it was different for a long time from the United States, 18 years old. But even then, either way, it's, it's comparatively arbitrary. It's, it's, it's an arbitrary thing that's made a law that's made by men and women who are sexually corrupt and have little position of credibility in saying one thing or another. And that can sound like over, overly defensive or whatever, but we're saying that for the record. Now, that being said, what we define as adulthood is when a, a being, a, a human being, has the propensity to procreate. When a woman begins to menstruate, whether that's at 12 or whether that's at 16, 17, or whenever she begins to menstruate, that is the definition of her becoming a woman. And that is substantiated by traditional ritual. Whether we're talking about bat mitzvah is less traditional as compared to bar mitzvah. But the rites of passage, in addition, within the traditions around the world, signify that. The very primordial, the, the, the very primal traditions, native traditions, and additionally, uh, are, are involved around the emergence of a woman's menstruation. So that's the definition, that's our definition of who, uh, who is a woman, regardless of what her age is. If she's 12 and menstruating, technically she's a woman. Does that mean she's ready for marriage and additionally? That's up to her parents, herself, her, the standards of socialization and additionally. It takes a lot to prepare a person to be in society and we recognize that. But that's the definition on uh, menstruation. Now for the, for the men's side, the boy's side, it's a matter of when a, a boy starts to, to produce semen. And when doing so, that's the, uh, he's able to procreate at that point. And that is, that is the uh, entry into uh, the manhood uh, category. So that's the definition. And again, that can happen at 12 years old, that can happen at 16, 17 years old, or whenever. So that's it. There's not a specific number uh, of year completion that signifies that experience. So um, that's, that's our definition. Now, people can look at the law of the land of the United States today and say, oh, that's definitely not the law, da, 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 da. But again, how arbitrary and how inconsistent and volatile is the law? Drinking age, cons conscription age, and additionally. And the sex thing is also along those lines. We're not, it's not a fortuitous type of thing where we're, we're trying to change law, whatever. The law is comparatively inconsequential. This is what nature is. This is what this is what tradition is, um, and the law will adjust itself and fluctuate, continue to fluctuate itself accordingly. So that, that's comparatively inconsequential. Now we have to reconcile. We have to deal with the conditions of the moment and, and how it's perceived, or whatever else. We're not out to do this, that, and the other. Um, but that's where we're coming from. Now, additionally, what we also recognize is until that age of 18. Even though it's illegal for somebody over the age of 18 uh, to have sex with somebody who's under the age of 18, at the same time, just facts, is that children from the earliest ages all the way up through 18 are woefully sexually corrupted through exposure of sexual activity, through films, through media, now it's social media, and additionally, and, and through think ways that are, are perceived or proclaimed as being legal. and so. Children are being sexually corrupted at very early ages, um, and that translates into sexual activity, it translates into promiscuity, it translates into sexual uh, trafficking, sexual exploitation, modeling, um, uh, and other forms of, of sexual exploitation of children, quote unquote, under the age of 18. So it's already being done it's to the point where once a person reaches, once a woman reaches the age of 18, uh, she's already significantly, by and large, uh, corrupted within the normalcy of, of society. Same thing with a man. Same thing with a boy. Most likely is not a virgin. That We can talk about statistics in that respect. But most, most likely, pervasively, has already seen or witnessed uh, some type of sexual activity, has been witnessed and, 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 and uh, exposed to much uh, public seduction, um, and and uh, suggestion of sexual intercourse from others um, just through public interaction. 
uh, and, and again through media and additionally and so there's this woeful uh, corruption of, of sexual corruption of youth before the age of 18 to the point where youth are already sexually active by and large before the age of 18 uh, and in that sexual activity become further um, uh, uh, linked, cuffed, um, bound through those sexual interactions because um, it's all a cipher and those ciphers are political uh, they become hierarchies uh, they, they become pretenses for recruitment meaning like um, which fine women are going to get to which university um, and and additionally and, and who who that that's when the valuations become uh, occur in the courting process of who has who who's better than others and, and additionally but it's along the lines of the of the uh, the sexual circles uh, that are being once once a youth has been recruited uh, within that so it's already happening before the age of 18 um, and and uh, the the age of 18 becomes like a bypass for, for just like an excuse it's like the draconian method of just making the laws so so um, like harsh everybody's violating it it's just a question of who gets persecuted for that so anyways not hating that's just what it is um, and so because of that recognizing the the fallacy of that um, paying less heed to it accordingly um, all right so that's where we're coming from in terms of our our beliefs and our perspectives about the conditions of today doesn't mean we go out looking for it and additionally however because youth from the age of earliest ages but particularly from middle school to high school from the ages of 11 12 all the way through 18 are significantly sexually corrupted and not just sexually corrupted but just like um, socially corrupted um, by the time a woman reaches the age of 18 she's very hardened into the ways of society uh, either that or she's very sheltered and not having a lot of public interaction uh, but by and large the women who are at age 18 even when being virgin are still very hardened um, and uh, and indoctrinated in, in one kind of strand of corruption within society and thus are less of a um, an immediate priority prospect of marriage it's, and that's not not some evaluation per se it's just a matter of recognizing the compatibility because in that corruption it's a big step to walk to walk into a path of, 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 of balance righteousness and, and, and whatever else let us tell it amidst all our proclamations and uh, and such and such so um, that's the actuality so that by the time a woman is 18 she's already very hardened generally speaking within the ways of society and corrupted within the ways of society even if she's all, still a virgin uh, and that's the difficulty because when when searching for a woman who is further virtuous um, who is increasingly feminine uh, and additionally it tends to be she has to be younger uh, even 17 16 years old 15 14 is gets way way young but still at the high school level where she's less exposed to the corruption she's less hardened by the corruption she's less attached and chained to the corruption still has the propensity of seeing truth of trusting in truth uh, and being disciplined in truth as a way of, um, of of protection and stability and sustenance within a righteous life uh, it is a younger age otherwise the older she is the bigger of a step it is the further difficult it is to to to, to distance from the chains of temptation um, luxury elitism and otherwise so that's that's where we're coming from in this respect um, and it's difficult to honor the earthly laws concerning the legal age because of awareness of the woeful corruptions when when there's the things like the Epstein Island situation and, and all the politicians involved those are the lawmakers those are the ones who are dictating what the legal age is and additionally and when the, those kinfolk are the ones who are enveloped in the violations of that it's very difficult to give any credence to that now that doesn't that doesn't mean it's, it stops the the pers prosecutors persecutors or anybody else from endeavoring to to like get at people or, or those things being utilized as a way of setting people up or otherwise so we're mindful of that however like if when kinfolk try to like do any type of like logical argument or, or uh, ethical argument um, again any US citizen just plain and simple needs to shut the fuck up before saying anything about anyone doing anything facts now continuing on with this self-deprecating or self um, uh, whatever whatever hi um, continuing on 
what am I talking about? What am I doing? Um, it is a matter of recognizing that in the conditions of today, uh, we'll talk about what's legal. First, well, well, much of it is unhealthy. Can't say all of it because, again, some people are further right, prepared for marriage than others at different ages. So can't say like just uh, involvement with a person at a certain age is, is unhealthy categorically. But, but by and large, it's favorable to be further to be further mature, further in one's house before uh, committing oneself to a marriage and a lifetime uh, partnership with somebody else and bringing new life into this earth. Um, so that being said, what we recognize as legal. Well, let, like I said, modeling, um, a woman, uh, girls uh, taking, having their photographs taken, uh, girls in swimsuits, and I'm saying girls, looking at plain department store ads that are posted where it's girls um, in bikinis, girls, nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, am I lying? Girls are, are photographed by people that are not their family, uh, wearing very scantily uh, clad swimwear. I won't say lingerie, although I don't want to speak to them. I don't watch that stuff, I don't look for it. I'm just remembering from times when I've seen things through the years, um, it being that young. So um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like, speak too much out on that in terms of like reaching of, of uh, examples, but swimsuit is enough. Um, but it's where, where girls are, are very significantly exposed if other than explicitly like fully naked it's very near um, and, and that's sexual exploitation but it's legal because it's modeling and the line of drawing is, is like well it's not complete nudity so um, that's 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 where the trouble is then uh, it does become further uh, provocative um, and otherwise I'm gonna get to a point Modeling is one example. Um, commercials uh, and other things that are just displaying the beauty of, of, of young women, young sister. In addition to that, we're talking about dancing. And, and we've talked about this before. Traditional dance is a sacred thing. It's a, it's a necessary thing. It's a valuable thing. It's a way of introducing uh, kinfolk, uh, boys and girls into the experience of adulthood. Um, Traditionally, uh, within each of our traditions around the world, there are rituals that prepare girls into sexual activity through marriage. There are rituals that prepare men for sexual activity through marriage. Um, and, and it's done in a public village way, through dance, through rituals and otherwise, through ceremonies. So the traditional dances today are part of that and, and, and are a valuable and necessary part of that. That being said, there's also awareness of dance, uh, traditional dance, and even and particularly contemporary dance being utilized as a way of sexually exploiting children without that component of marriage, without that intentionality of marriage. It might, might have some intentionality um, <clears throat> and rationale of getting a scholarship or getting some remuneration, a prize or whatever else <clears throat> to provide some economic benefit, but that becomes prostitution. Um, and it's not the long-term, lifelong arrangement and security, particularly for a sister. Um, that is uh, part of the traditional protocols. So, um, there are some dances that are further revealing than others. <clears throat> um, there are some dances that are done in the direct company of other brethren so that <clears throat> there's less susceptibility to the exploitation, the immediate direct exploitation of predators that are outside the community, that are unknown and unaccountable to the community. Then there are others that are further, um, there are other forms of dance or there are other presentations of dance that are made available to the public and further exposed to predators amidst the public. Um, I'm trying to think of how specific I am in terms of acknowledging or, or, or addressing the specific type of dances I'm talking about without being too um, imbalanced in terms of the ethnic representation or the cultural representation within the dance. Because it happens along different cultures, but it happens at high class, I'll put it that way. I'll put it, it happens at high class, high income, um, high society circles in, in the dances 
the traditional and contemporary dances of such such uh, kinfolk. It happens in quote unquote low income, low class. I don't want to say low class, but um, the the um, the put upon class um, through the traditional and contemporary dances. Uh, so it's across the board, and it's actually and there's an intentionality of it. It's it's it's, it's a way of introducing Sistrin, um, presenting the availability like a cotillion, like a debutante situation, uh, presenting here are the children, here are the girls in in our in our community that are available for uh, partnership, or, or when it's even worse exploitation, um, and then there's a, there's that legitimate skill that's conveyed, the the style of dance, and additionally, and 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 part of the purpose of the dance is the in, the, the seduction, the, the enticement, the, the uh, energizing of the brethren who watch the dance. It's, again, it's a natural um, uh, tribal uh, experience. It's a primordial experience. It's part of the mating process, just like with birds and, and other animals. So uh, it's not a condemnation of the actual uh, aggregate of the process, but it's a matter of communicating the concerns about how it's manifested um, given today's conditions and technology as well. So peace and blessings. What's up? What's up, man? Um, just doing. All right. So, um, that being said, I, I'm going to try to to articulate this without being specific uh, about any particular type of dance because again, it's across the board. So I'll, I'll describe the conditions or the the general circumstances of what I'm describing, um, and what it is concerned. So, um. All right, yeah, and, and, and there's also a particular point to this as well. I'm gonna have to check this. We where the battery is is getting there at this point, and now we're gonna work on storage. All right, we can decent with the storage. All right, um, all right. So I'm gonna give a general, some descriptions about how this applies to different types of dance. I won't even list. I've listed dances because we work with traditional dance at this point. We work on doing this in a healthier way, but at the same time, there's there's the envelopment within the exploited, the, even just the implicit. Uh, latent uh, tendencies of exploitation even when people aren't trying to be that way so we're, we're calling this out so that we can be further mindful and accountable uh, and further dutiful uh, in, in promoting the well-being of, of the sister involved the brethren involved all kinfolk involved um, so I'm going to describe the general like some of the general uh, characteristics um, that are that are found within many of these types of dances without specifying the specific culture or the specific class or otherwise but um, what I'm specifically talking about is uh, dance groups around the world within different cultures where the girls, uh, I'll say that I'm going to say the women because there's going to be a working presumption that each of the women, even if it's not the actuality, there's going to be a presumption that each of the, the sisters involved are menstruating. So we're going to talk about, the, the ages go lower than this, but we're going to talk about those those groups that, that, that are around the age of from between 12 to 18 and 12 to even 20 and above. So that's the age group we're talking with. So presumably each of the participants can be measuring, but it might not necessarily be the case. Uh, and it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not for us to know one way or the other specifically, but just to be mindful of that, those, that's the, the framework we're, that we're talking about. So in this situation, the Sistrin are taught legitimate, beautiful, sacred, traditional dances that typically through the, through the history are only presented within the village where the people who are, who are participating, the people who are the audience are the family members and village members and have a vested interest and commitment to the well-being of the sisters who are presenting themselves and to the brethren who are presenting themselves. That's typically, historically, the circumstances. Today, at this point, the way the circumstances are is that these presentations are made and when they're posted on the internet, again, it's the legitimate ceremonies, it's the legitimate rehearsals and, and um, um, recitals and additionally that's been done for centuries but when it's presented to a general public that has no vested interest or has very little vested interest in the community little vested interest in the culture little vested interest in the kinfolk that is an increasing concern um, so uh, some of the characteristics of what is observed in terms of how the cistern are presented the dances themselves involve uh, gesticulation of, of, I mean, it's very, it's, it's very sexually suggestive in very overt ways and very subtle ways, depending upon the culture. It involves movements of the hips, uh, signifying and in, 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 um, manifesting fertility, um, and even just the energy. Uh, the w w girls are extremely powerful when it comes to the, the experience of fertility. 
Uh, brethren too. I'm going to focus specifically on girls because the nature of the exploitation of boys is a little bit different. Um, but for the cistern, the girl's fertility and virility is extremely potent. And, 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 and slight movements and slight training how to how to move, posture, and initially is extremely effective in influencing the minds, the hearts, even the spirits and the bodies of men and boys too. So, um, and that's part of the purpose of the training of, of, of dance is to know those traditional traditional movements, attuning it with the movements that the ancestors do hundreds and thousands of years ago uh, and guide us because those movements are part of the nature, relationship with nature, um, mimicking and, and attuning with the movements of animals, the birds, trees, and additionally. So it's, it's a primordial garden experience and it's very necessary. It's miraculous and beautiful when it's shared in a healthy and, and, and respectful and, and supportive way. Um, and, it's, it, it, and it's very sexual and it's very suggestive. It's very powerful and influential. Um, and it moves men to do things positive and negative, uh, which is why it's beneficial to be shared in a secure enclave that is committed towards the well-being of the kinfolk involved, all the kinfolk involved, the participants who are, doing, who are being presented, the parents, the teachers, and the community as a whole. So, um, I mean, I can get into further details because, like I said, it's done in different ways. There are cultures that are very subtle, that emphasize certain types of movements and other communities that, that are further um, uh, pronounced and, and emphasize other other types of movements. Uh, but in each of those respects, the uh, the sexual energy of the girls is 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 being shared, is being presented to the entirety of the audience, and it's very influential um, and and suggested. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to conjure within men. Yo, I want to have sex. I want to have relations with a woman. I want to have a baby. I want to support that baby. I am motivated. I'm seeing that, that young, young sister. Yo, and I want to work. I want to do work. I'm ready to work. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what's supposed to be done. And, and it's supposed to be in the, in the viewing, in the, in, the, um, in the sanction of the entirety of the community so that it is proper, that it is conducive towards relationship and well-being and lifetime support marriage contract and additionally that's the purpose of it um, so I can be further specific about the different types of movement but I'm, I'm, I think I've, I've, I've conveyed the gist of it in that respect um, but the, the important thing is to recognize that just because one culture presents it in a very uh, pronounced way and another culture does it in a very subtle way it's still extremely sexually um, provocative it's sexually um, suggestive uh, and it's, it's, it significantly influences the, the thoughts and behavior, uh, communication and spirit of men. Um, and it's supposed to. So, just recognizing that. Now, that being said, um, I, I am supposed to be somewhat explicit here because um, I'm supposed to compare what is legal to what is not legal. So, um, in, the, in that movement, when, when, the, when the, the women, the young women from age 12 to 18 years old and plus are, are being presented by the community, the teachers, the schools, and the community in this respect, um, the women and, and the movement of the women um, and, and uh, the movement of the sexual energy of the women, uh, there's a certain exposure of the women's bodies, um, whether that's thighs, whether that's... Um, uh, bosoms in terms of being covered but still exposure of bosoms, uh, navel area, um, shoulders, arms, even pelvic region and additionally, uh, even to the point of like outlines of uh, the pubic area, pubic hair, uh, armpits, hair on the head and, and additionally. I mean there's a lot of exposure but according to the earthly law of the United States and additionally, technically, presumably, it's not pornography because it's not explicit exposure of the genitalia. It's not nipples, it's not vagina or labia or otherwise. So by those definitions, it's technically not pornography. However, it's still very extremely suggestive. It's still very much exposing. It's an exhibition of the sexual uh, energy and nature of the women involved. Uh, and it has the susceptibility of being utilized for exploitational purposes. Um, so, that's where the challenge, and, and it, but at the same time, it's all legal, and that's where the challenge is because uh, even when it's done 
in that respect, which is in a way that's perceived as legal or proclaimed as legal because it's not explicit exposure. Um, still, um, one, it's very sexual. It's very sexual suggestive. It conjures within men um, this this uh, this angst, uh, and so how else will that angst be alleviated uh, in a healthy way without that without without those top type of um, assurance beforehand about commitment and involvement within communities so that's one of the challenges because when when the response is well you know men are just have to go and defend for themselves no that's not how it happens men are men go for it one way or the other um, and it avails itself to the susceptibility of being precursors and pre-arrangements for other types of um, scenarios that are further sexually exploitative uh, and again we don't wish that we don't we don't advocate that that's unhealthy it's wrong it's atrocity but the preceding conditions are legal through the through the earthly law the healthy methodologies of relationship commitment between men and women are woefully obstructed by earthly law um, and the normalcy of the hierarchy of leadership that is discerning the law is enveloped in these corruptions and exploitations so for the ordinary citizen for the ordinary civilian for the ordinary person it's just a matter of recognizing this um, now that's one scenario and then we talk about what's legal what is legal uh, all types of exposure uh, nudity uh, sexual intercourse sexual promiscuity sexual extreme sexual perversion LGBTQ activity and otherwise all legal as long as people are over at the age of 18 so that's a way of directing those that angst and otherwise oh after watching the the, the young sister and being energized by that young sexual energy and virility then for the men who need that relief or whatever go to the pornography of the 18 year old and and just look at the naked body the chat room uh the recordings and and otherwise of all explicit full whatever that's still all legal um so uh, that's that's part of the challenge at the moment now, one of the things that precipitates this is just recently. This is a regular occurrence, and I don't want to. It's difficult to admonish because, again, it's natural. But at the same time, it's it's it's. This is this is this is the crux of existence in this life that we observe, which is which is mating, which is procreating, because uh, it's one thing we don't do by ourselves. So, on the, in this particular scenario, uh, and recently, there's the occasion of three sisters. Uh, I'm on a bus doing what I do. They're three sisters. They got on the bus. Three sisters, maybe 16, 17 year olds. Generally speaking, 16, 17 years old. Could be older, could be younger. Um, uh, very attractive, very pretty, very youthful energy, young, young sister energy. Um, dressed somewhat upper income, upper middle class kind of attire. One sister is wearing. A nice uh, short dress but it's like maybe a designer feminine uh, kind of joint so it's not just like it's tight or whatever but short but it's still above her thigh so she's she's showing the flesh her, her thick healthy 16 year old womenly thighs menstruating thighs um, along with her bosoms and additionally not explicitly exposed but but pronounced same thing with the other sister very attractive 16 year old healthy bodies um, and that yo that does things to a man beyond what he wants I'm not trying to look I'm, I'm at the back of the bus I see who gets on I see who gets on before they get on and I'm trying to look out the window trying to be disciplined in my mind and everything else like that but yo women young women particularly with that powerful sexual energy have an influence so uh that's just one experience in one day. And my point for saying that is that uh, I don't control what other women wear. I don't control what, how much women expose themselves and how young the women are in exposing themselves. And women do it for many different reasons. Uh, essentially, it's basically for attention, but for different...
in doing that, there's there's game. Women are looking for commitment and marriage and additionally. In the meanwhile, women are looking for attention and, and maybe running game um, or getting over or advertising services or otherwise. Now, again, I'm not saying that for every case, but one way or another, um, a woman is communicating all of those things, one way or another. Um, and the difficulty, and one thing that women just will not understand is how that affects a man, and it doesn't go away. It has to be processed one way or the other. Uh, the, the, the phenomena of must. Um, the, I guess one way of likening it, like comparing it most to what a woman might understand is like if a woman tries to hold her urine. Like people talk about going on fast and not eating for days. That's one thing. That's controlling what we put into our bodies and it can be very fatiguing. But at the same time, it's not the most difficult thing to do. Try not urinating or not defecating after a period that's even further difficult to withhold something from being ex, 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 um, exited excreted that's extremely difficult and nigh impossible if, if something in the body is is, is is making its way out it's making its way out one way or the other that's the most it, it's like the most accurate or most proximate way of describing a man being backed up or uh, whatever they call it semen retention or whatever else uh, it's just this accumulation of a force and energy um, that is that has this momentum of exiting, um, and the guidance is to, is to facilitate that process in the most healthy of ways um, in relationship, committed relations with a woman, because it's life, it's life force. There's there's infinite life that exists within a man's seed. There's infinite life that exists within a woman's seed. It's it's the life force of a man. It's life force of a woman. So it's, pr it's prudent, it behooves a man to guide that process with a with partnership with a woman and within partnership with a woman, committed, lifelong, supportive, mutually respectful, mutually supportive bond, marriage between a man and a woman. That's the most prudent. And it's beyond the individual volition of a man to do himself, which is the crux in, in the life that I described, procreation. Um, but that's the, most, that's the most proximate thing. And um, one of the challenges is that there is a way, presumably, that a man is able to retain himself perpetually in this life uh, through a vow of celibacy and the practices accordingly and the wisdom that's provided accordingly. So that's part of the challenge is that it becomes a mental thing. It becomes like it is possible that as long as he avails himself, as long as he recognizes some type of openness and necessity of procreating, that precludes the, the, the vow and the techniques of celibacy. He doesn't have that as, at his disposal because he acknowledges at some point he does have to emit that energy. Um, and so uh, there, there's fewer teachings about how to, um, uh, how to direct uh, how to cultivate that discipline uh, and how to uh, harness that energy. So um, that's part of the challenge. Ain't no excuses all across the board. A man is answerable to everything he does and says and thinks in this life. So we're just talking about like the, the circumstances and the phenomena um, for people's information and literacy. So um, when, when I don't control what women wear and that has a significant influence on what we think, what men think, and what we communicate and what we do accordingly. And it's for women to recognize that and to respect and honor that. Uh, and it's not a matter of individual liberty, liberty or liberalism or whatever else. It's cause and effect and recognizing how what one, one does affects others. So um, that's part of it. And when, when that is happening, just going to work or going to, 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 to the store or just doing our errands, and the women are presenting the sexual energy, women's sexual energy, in such a pronounced way. Um, it has that tendency and that susceptibility of discouraging within a man, influencing a man into uh, other things. And it's not shirking the blame. It's not, it's not um, guilt tripping or whatever else. It's just being plain and simple, recognizing the cause and effect. the very least the challenges
that are caused. And the culpability, because there is onus on women for doing that. Um, and their ways of being healthier, their ways of being further respectful and further supportive. So, uh, so when those types of scenarios, when those types of um, incidents, those occurrences are a regular occurrence and men are regularly exposed to the sexual energy of women, um, it becomes a form of sexual exploitation on men uh, because we said before, women are stronger than men mentally. Men are stronger than women physically, generally speaking. Uh, and so um, it, it is, men are responsible for men's own actions and can't blame nobody for anything. But at the same time, um, there are things that are healthy and there are, are things that are harmful. So when a woman is causing harm to a man through mentally exploiting him through her sexuality, um, it is appropriate to acknowledge that, to address that. Um, and when there is a refusal of uh, designating spaces where men can live, communities of men, communities of men and women can live without those, the imposition of those exposures, um, advertisements, being around in public and additionally, without being exposed to that type of uh, sexual energy and, and uh, um, seduction and otherwise then there's an increasing onus of such societies uh, to address the conditions. Otherwise, designate places, designate regions, designate provinces where people can live without these types of um, pollutions, these types of cognitive pollutions, of seduction. Sex is, and marriage is an extremely healthy and miraculous thing, but seduction and sexual exploitation is pollution, is harmful. So um, society needs, in order for society to sustain itself, it needs to accommodate healthiness. Um, we don't, nothing is needed from government. Nothing is needed from the militaries. The military is not providing anything anybody needs. Facts. The military is not providing that. Governments at this point are not providing anything people need. Governments are further obstructive than productive. Militaries are further obstructive than productive. Corporations are further obstructive than productive. Um, and so it's not even a matter of rebelling. It's not even a matter of, of revolution. It's not even a matter of taking over and conquering any corporation or any nation or any military. It's not happening. That's, that's any, any entity that endeavors to do that is just replacing one corporation with another, one nation, one, one violent nation with another, one violent corporation with another. So that's not the way of doing it. Um, the nations are annihilating themselves, the corporations are annihilating themselves, um, whatever the other group I said, uh, corporations, nations, and whatever else, it's, it's annihilating itself. The message is to acknowledge what is healthy lifestyles that are healthy relationship with nature that is healthy and to optimize that experience to optimize that lifestyle to optimize that discipline to optimize that modesty to optimize that relationship when we do that even at the micro individual level and at the family level at the clan and village level. Then we communicate to the behemoth entities, the macros. You need to make space. You need to designate a, an area where you're not gonna do this bullshit. You're, not to call, you're gonna cause this pollution for your own well-being, for your own credibility, for your own anchoring within this earth and in this universe. You need us to be in an environment that is healthy. You're not providing it ourselves. You're not providing it. You're not, you're not even allowing it to exist. You're obstructing it. And you're obstructing 
your obstructing your obstruction of what is healthy is causing your own annihilation because in that obstruction you deteriorate your own credibility such that you become increasingly and exclusively reliant upon force people aren't even buying the bullshit at this point it becomes force and that's that's a very short-lived gain uh, because either you have to be forceful and then people respond to that and then there's mass overthrow mutiny of the pirate ship or you become susceptible to somebody or others some somebody or some buddies that have greater force than you do one way or the other it gets undone the way for you to have sustainability in this game of life is by doing some type actually it's by doing some type of good some type of promotion of well-being in this life but even then the possibility of you doing that to be honest is actually very negligible at the very least stop stop causing harm stop and not even stop causing harm stop obstructing healthy living you are imposing unhealthiness citizens of the United States you are imposing unhealthiness through the mass production of GMOs um, fertilized food and such unhealthy food and mass inflation of regular processed food and very little availability of healthy organic food obstructing people from growing their own organic food uh, causing pollution um, air pollution, water pollution, land pollution, and additionally, you're poisoning the immediate environment. You're, you're, you're obstructing healthy living categorically. And you're utilizing the threat of violence, whether it's dropping bombs, whether it's homelessness, whether it's being locked up in a corporate prison construct, you're utilizing violence as a semblance of civil order and it is increasingly deteriorating because at some point people just don't give a fuck any further and are uncontrollable and we don't want that you don't want that to your own disadvantage because it's beyond your control you're only you're only um you're only fulfilling a shift we recognize that you recognize that um you focus on your shift and then trust that after your shift is completed you'll be looked after somewhat somehow some way that scenario though is less and less plausible you already see that by the way elders are treated what what pensioners are living from based upon what they were making 20 30 40 years ago and otherwise so you already know and that's and that's in the scenario of the theater of the United States still being like discussed on this earth let alone something else comes along and everything else changes so then obviously there's also the truth and reconciliation process and the tribunals and who gets uh, accounted for what and what the repercussions are accordingly because in that resettling of this continent um, there may be there may be a number of different scenarios for different participants for those who are further involved, the rich, the powerful, the, the high and mighty of convention, might be secluded to um, very restricted reservations with very restricted conditions, whereby those that are less involved, the impoverished, the, the indigenous, and additionally, are provided with uh, further favorable fortuitous uh, reservations and, and accommodations of, of regions and provinces and expanses of land to live in the migrations and natural habitations of this continent. The scenarios, the scenarios may be incentivized to motivate certain members of society, the domestic plantation, to be further proactive in facilitating and initiating and furthering the truth and reconciliation process. 
because such is the nature of divide and conquer that precipitates the plantation. The symptoms, it's not even symptoms at this point, it's, it's like the advanced systems, or the advanced symptoms already manifesting that we discussed before. But anyways, I'm going on and on at this point. We've, we've shared the gist of it. Have we reached the solution or a, a, like a, some type of viable guidance concerning the circumstances in terms of sexual exploitation as, as it pertains to young cistern? Um, I guess it's a matter of like recognizing how, the, how and why the law, how and why the lines are drawn about what is perceived as legal, what is perceived as illegal. What is what are legitimate uh, laws? What are legitimate lines and criteria for the protection of, and well-being of kinfolk? And what are arbitrary or ambiguous or dishonest lines and laws? What is the nature of exploitation in those gaps? Um, the the gray areas, the cloudiness, uh, the manipulations extortion exploitation within those gaps and in gray areas um, and then what is healthy what is legitimately um, the healthy methodology and how is that healthy methodology um, practiced how is that healthy methodology supported by the laws and lines how is that healthy methodology uh, enforced I missed all of it um, the answers are simple the answers are difficult the answers are within us the answers are within respecting and sharing with each other honesty compassion and modesty And the answers are inevitable. There is no outpowering the devil. There is no outsmarting the devil. There is no outliving the devil in this world, in this life. There is conquering the devil. And we conquer the devil by conquering ourselves and living for a greater purpose, living for an eternal purpose. living for an eternal sentience, an eternal intelligence, an eternal, an eternal power, and eternal harmony. Equilibrium shows us clearer. With that being said, we give all thanks and praise to the Most High, Elohim, blessed love and peace in Rastafari.